Reading now from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, There was once a rich man who had a servant who managed his property. The rich man was told that the manager was wasting his master's money. So he called him and said, What is this I hear about you? Turn in a complete account of your handling of my property, because you cannot be my manager any longer. The servant said to himself, My master is going to dismiss me from my job. What shall I do? I am not strong enough to dig ditches, and I am ashamed to beg. Now I know what I will do. Then when my job is gone, I shall have friends who will welcome me in their homes. So he called in all the people who were in debt to his master. He asked the first one, How much do you owe my master? One hundred barrels of olive oil, he answered. Here is your account, the manager told him. Sit down and write fifty. Then he asked another one, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he answered. Here is your account, the manager told him. Write eight hundred. As a result, the master of this dishonest manager praised him for doing such a shrewd thing. Because the people of this world are much more shrewd in handling their affairs than the people who belong to the light. And Jesus went on to say, And so I tell you, make friends for yourselves with worldly wealth, so that when it gives out, you will be welcomed in the eternal home. Arguably, it is one of the most confusing parables that Jesus tells. The parable of the shrewd or dishonest manager. Let's review the facts as we know them. We start with two characters, the rich man and his manager. Word on the street is that the manager has been embezzling funds and taking kickbacks. And the rich man summons him to his office for a pre-firing dressing down. In serious hot water, the manager realizes that he's not trained for any other type of job and better lay the groundwork for his future. As a result, he goes to his master's clients and reduces their bills, thereby earning himself their gratitude. I think we can follow the parable to this point. Apparently the manager is trying to make the best of a bad situation. And since he's already defrauded his boss, he might as well go the mile and make himself look good by unethically taking, or reducing rather, the amount of money that his clients owe. And so therefore, boost the level of his collections. It's all quite doable, since the manager has both hands in the books. Now you would think that when the master found out that his manager had again cheated him out of money, he would call for the tar and feathers. But no. Jesus says, that the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal home. Say, what? 
Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. Jesus' words are completely baffling. They just don't seem to match the type of behavior he usually asks us to display. There's nothing in the Sermon on the Mount like, blessed are the shrewd, for they shall make eternal homes by way of dishonest wealth. Is there? Well, if any of you are as confused as I am about this parable, don't panic. There is hope. First of all, remember that the parables are meant to be confusing. They are meant to turn conventional wisdom upside down and leave listeners scratching their heads and praying for guidance. So let's give it another go. Bear with me. Have you ever noticed that any parable where there is a master or some sort of father figure as a main character, he's taken to represent God? Think of the parable of the prodigal son, where the father in the story doles out forgiveness to his son in the same lavish way that God forgives us when we are lost. Now consider this morning's reading, namely the parable of the shrewd or dishonest manager. The manager forgives large portions of his client's debts. Not out of love, mind you, let's not kid ourselves, but at best out of mixed motives, principal among them, I'm sure, being his own self-interest. He wants these debtor peasants to feel gratitude for what he has done, in essence, to feel once again indebted to him. So that when he finally does lose his job, when his master finally fires him, some of them will remember what he has done and take pity on him. Give him a helping hand. Maybe even let him stay in their house for a couple of nights. And by contrast, the rich master quite unexpectedly forgives his manager with no strings attached, no hidden agenda. The master allows his manager to keep his job despite his obvious dishonesty. And I ask you, isn't this exactly what you would expect God to do? Do we not believe that God forgives us no matter what? In the same way that the master forgives his manager? That's point one in this parable. God forgives us like the master forgives. Second point. Jesus taught, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or in some older texts, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that seems to be what's happening in this parable. The dishonest manager is forgiven even as he forgives the debts of others. And this is the best part. It's not neat and tidy and clean cut, is it? There's still some loose ends and some ethical questions and uncertainty that's connected with this parable. Because Jesus knows that this is what our lives are like. We're not God. And we cannot offer one another perfect love. We're human. And we're always going to have mixed motives 
and screw things up. Even when we're trying to do the right thing. So therefore, Jesus knows us better, really, than we know ourselves. And in this parable, he tells us that's okay. That's okay. It's okay to have mixed motives and make mistakes. What's important is that we keep trying. If we waited to forgive each other until we had perfect charity in our hearts, I think we'd be here until the apocalypse. Jesus is saying, just haul off and do it, isn't he? Forgive everyone. Forgive people even if you know they're wrong. Forgive people when you know you're wrong. Forgive people when you don't feel like it. When people aren't talking to you. When you aren't talking to them. When you don't have time. Forgive people you've never met. Forgive atrocities so big, you're afraid to forgive them. Forgive faults so small, you're ashamed that they even bother you. Forgive even if you've done it a thousand times. Forgive even if you've never forgiven before. Forgive like the manager forgives. Not perfectly, but nonetheless. So on first look, this is a wonderful interpretation of the parable, isn't it? And a wonderful lesson to learn. God is magnanimous, we sin, and yet God forgives us, no matter what, over and over and over again. And then we learn to forgive too. And folks, if I stop now, right this instant, with that interpretation, you could go home early for lunch. Don't all rush at once now. And you would feel all fuzzy-wuzzy for the rest of the day with that interpretation, wouldn't you? But I'm sorry. I can't stop. Not now. Just as I did my first Sunday here, when I preached about the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to turn this parable upside down. We're going to have a different peek at what's going on. 